Connor from Jesus Life here. Happy Easter. I miss hanging out with everyone, but I'm so happy church can happen in the home and revival is coming to the family unit. Well, happy Easter. This is John from Stone Creek. There is no canceling Easter. The only time it's ever going to be canceled is when Jesus comes back again, and that's going to be a great celebration. Glad you could join us this morning. Hi, everybody. It's Trent from Becoming Church. I hope you have an amazing Easter morning with your families and that Jesus is right in the midst of it. God bless all of you. Hey, good morning, everybody. Ryan from The Bridge, and we miss being out here with you, but we love our city. We love what God's doing in this city, and we can't wait to be out here again with you next year. But for this year, happy Resurrection Sunday from all of us. Amen. Hey, good morning, Bridge Church family and friends joining us online. Happy Resurrection Sunday. This is a day in which we give all glory to the King, our victorious Savior who is resurrected. Come on, let's sing out this morning. Let's join together. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you form. Faith commanded Things. Just trust in you, believe in you. So, nothing 
shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We'll shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable Nothing shall be
praise you, Lord. Come on, we just give you all the praise today, Lord. Your resurrection power offered to us through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Wow, Lord. Lord, we just, we just embrace everything you have for us today. We thank you, Lord. Your word says your mercies are new every morning. Lord, we just want to join in faith with your heart for this day, for our future, forever. I love your word says in Galatians 5.1, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. And the life which I live in the flesh here now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your suffering that allowed us to enter into a relationship heart to heart with the Father. It's with that, Lord, and with that gratitude, we continue to sing to you this morning.
Come on, can we just close this morning with an affirmation of all Christ did for us? Singing this together in every home. Just imagine all the different faces at home. Imagine all the generations singing this together. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he Praise you. That is our reality. Church, that's our reality. White as snow, mercies new. <sighs> Happy Easter. Happy Easter. I so desperately want to give you all a hug and just woo, high five on our Savior, our resurrected King. You know, He's the victor now and forever for all eternity. But, you know, for now, we have to settle to this house to house and um, you know come together that's why the comments even when you make those uh, you know on, online and, and sort of talk and, and your prayer requests and those different things they matter we listen we, we press in together as a church family still we are still together we are still one before I turn it over to announcements I want you to uh, enjoy this really fun video we got right here check it out <laughs> <laughs> After Jesus died, they put Jesus in a tomb and wrapped him with some white paper. They put a big stone around it and placed guards in front of the tomb to let nobody go in. He was just waiting for the three days. He's probably drinking soda while eating hot Cheetos. <laughs> he would probably play games like Candyland, and then have a party by himself. The yeah. Easter Bunny was hiding behind a tree. <laughs> he probably went out there and just, just throw eggs everywhere. And then he gonna say, there's one money egg, so you better find it. You will get some money. <laughs> Three days later, there was a big earthquake. <laughs> I think we should go away somewhere safe. It's like I'm getting out of here. The earth is shaking. Run for your lives. <laughs> and the guards ran off because they got scared. And then on Sunday, Mary and some of her friends came with some spices. But when they got there, the tomb was empty. His clothes only was there. Then an angel came and said, Don't be afraid. Jesus has risen from the dead. Go tell the go tell everyone. Go tell the good news. Mary and her friends went and told the disciples. She said, Jesus has risen from the dead. Guys, guys, Jesus has risen from the dead. And the disciples didn't believe them. No! That couldn't happen. Jesus can't raise from the dead. Uh, I don't believe it until I see it. But all of a sudden, Jesus, Jesus just came, just was there. I am Jesus. I am the. I'm the. I am the Son of the Lord God, and I am Jesus, your friend. And then the disciples said, "Jesus, it's you!" Yay! Jesus is alive! Totes cool. Jesus, before he left to heaven, he said, I have done what I have come to do. And then he risen, then he was going up to heaven. His disciples were crowded around him. The disciples said, holy guacamole. I can't believe Jesus really flew. That's awesome. Now what? Let's go tell the news. Good morning, church family. And for those of you who have joined us online today, 
My name is Mike Fole, and I have the honor of being the care pastor here at the bridge. And I want to say to you, happy Resurrection Day. So glad that we're together. One really important event coming up in the life of our church is an eight-week study called Emotionally Healthy Relationships. In each of those eight weeks, we're going to center in on just one relational topic each week. How to do conflict in a healthy way how to express your expectations of relationship in a way that promotes clarity. And one of the ones I'm most looking forward to, a whole week on helping us become better empathetic listeners. You can register for this eight-week study online on our website. And we look forward to seeing you grow and mature and deepen your relationships with everyone that's a part of your life. Emotionally healthy relationships beginning in May. Just want to remind you there are three different ways in which you can digitally give your tithes and offerings here at the bridge. And for those of you like me who like to write checks, you can always send them into our church office as well. Thank you so much for your ongoing faithful support of the ministries of the Bridge Church. Let's take a moment now and thank God for what he's been doing in the life of our family. Father, we're so thankful for the gift of your son on this day. We're so thankful, God, that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death has been defeated. And we've been born again to a living hope because of a resurrected Savior. Father, I'm also thankful today that we've come to a place where we understand that every good and every perfect gift comes down from you. And because we understand that we've been so blessed by you, Jesus, it's the reflex of our soul to give back. So, Father, take these monies that come in, in whatever way. And Lord, use them to extend your purposes, advance your kingdom here on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Zarik. The tomb was indeed empty, and that empty tomb changed everything for the disciples and for the rest of the world. The empty tomb is the game changer. You know, I want to do something fun this morning. I, it's a tradition. Many of you know it. You have maybe thought this was your grandparents' tradition or your parents' tradition if you're kids, but actually it goes way back. This is a a, a centuries, centuries old tradition in the church. And it's where we say, he is risen, and you repeat, he is risen indeed. And it actually comes right out of this passage here in Luke 24. As the story goes on, the women come back. They say, we, we saw that the tomb was rolled away, and then we saw these angels, and they said he's not here. 
And, uh, and, and two of the disciples, uh, they just kind of left bewildered, trying to figure out what all this meant. And so they're on a road. It's called the, they're on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus shows up among them, and he asks them some questions and stirs it up, and then he reveals who he is to them as the risen Lord. And they see him, and all of a sudden, everything changes for them. The empty tomb becomes a reality, and they race back to Jerusalem that very hour, it says, and they tell everybody else that was there that heard, he is risen indeed. And that's where this comes from. He's risen indeed, meaning the story is true. We've seen him. It really happened. Jesus is alive. And so I want to do this. I'm going to say he is risen, and then you repeat back to me, he is risen indeed. All of us, all the kids, everybody, nice and loud, as if you could hear it through the TV, all right? He is risen. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Well, we talked about this idea of empty, and that video really brought it home. I don't know if you've ever actually had a tank run out of gas. I remember once in my 66 Mustang, uh, you know, I had a meter. It wasn't digital like today's where they tell you you have five miles until empty or six miles or 12 miles. Uh, there was a line and there was a letter and that was the letter E. And I was on my way to the gas station and the light turned green. The gas station was just across on the other corner and I pushed the gas to start going and it started for a second and then all of a sudden the car just went and shut down. But I had just enough momentum to carry me through the intersection, up the driveway, and then right next to the pump. And I was very grateful. I wish that was the only time I ever ran out of gas. I won't tell you how many times that's happened, but it doesn't happen very much anymore. But when something is empty, it means that it's missing its contents. An empty park this Easter means it's missing the 1,500 Easter worshipers that are usually there at Central Park and RSM. And can I just say, we miss you. An empty home is missing the people, especially for some of us, our typical Easter gatherings where we all come together and celebrate as families and as large groups. And I will say, I'm already missing my family uh, and our family gathering this, this, this uh, year. I miss you already. An empty fridge means there's missing food. An empty wallet, missing money. An empty shelf means it's missing, well, let's see, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, Clorox wipes, and yeast and flour. I could just keep going on. An empty promise is missing sincerity. An empty life is missing purpose and meaning. An empty pursuit is missing the fulfillment that you were hoping for. Well, I want to say today that the empty tomb, the fact that Jesus is alive, is the answer to the solution to the emptiness that is common to all of us. It's an emptiness inside, on the inside. Let me ask you a question this Easter morning. Is there something missing inside of you Something missing in your life? Well, I want to open our Bibles to Luke 24 and read the account of, of Easter morning uh, from Luke's perspective. Again, here we are now 2,000 years later reading the witness accounts of what it was like, what happened, what took place in the lives of these who walked with Jesus and, and witnessed the cross and saw the suffering and the injustice and all that happened with that. Now, coming Sunday morning, expecting to continue in this new reality of Jesus is gone and our hopes are gone and, and something inside is broken and missing. And this is the expectation. Now we get to see the story through their eyes and you'll find that they experienced it very similar to the way a lot of us, even today, who hear the story again, have experienced it. One of the things that jumps out at me as I read this passage is this idea of empty pursuits. Empty pursuits, the, the things that we pursue hoping for a certain fulfillment that 
cannot come and never comes. Empty pursuits jumps off the page as we read this. Let's just read the first five verses of chapter 24. It says, but on the first day of the week, Sunday, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Now, the scene is powerful. The ladies have gone. They've carried spices. They were going to further wrap the body of Jesus in these spices and, and embalm them was part of their tradition. But they discover when they get there that the, the stone's been rolled away, the tomb is now open, and the body is missing. It's empty. And while they're trying to understand what all this means, two angels appear and speak to them. And they say these words. In fact, they ask this question. And I think this question is actually a commentary on humanity. It's a commentary on what it is we pursue, trying to answer probably one of the greatest, the greatest question that all of us have. And he asks, why do you seek the living among the dead? I believe, in fact, the Bible makes it really clear that people are seeking. They're looking for fulfillment, looking for something life-giving. But in every pursuit we'll ever pursue in this world, we'll come up empty. It's missing. Why do you seek something living in places that cannot bring life? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Intuitively, if we stop for a minute, philosophically, most everybody recognizes this is true. That people are actually searching for fulfillment in life in some way. In fact, this is kind of the, the basic understanding that marketers know about the human race. They know that Whoever they're talking to through their televisions or through the internet, through, through the radio, they're talking to people who are looking for something. Something is missing. And so then they design a product and they market it to that need, hoping that it will connect with you and that sense of what you're missing. This car can fulfill the desire you have for excitement. This phone can fulfill this desire that you have. This dating site can fulfill the need you have for relationship and connect with other people. And on and on and on. This new medication is going to change or solve the problem that you're dealing with. The assumption is this, that people are looking for something and this ad, this product can fulfill it. Empty pursuits. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Well, we're all seeking it because we all have experienced this emptiness. It's common to every human being. I brought a little illustration here to help me illustrate just the idea of it, the concept of it. Some of you maybe played with these when you were younger, when you were kids. Uh, it's like a shape box. I don't know what to call it, but a shape box. And it's got all these different uh, holes drilled into it. And I'm keying in on this one, this heart. Because as we understand the human race and God's creation, there is in every human soul, this box representing our soul, there is a, a sense of something missing. Something that needs to be fulfilled. And what happens is we find ourselves aware of that emptiness, seeking to fill it with something. So we look to relationships and we we think, oh, relationships, that's going to fulfill it. If, if, if I could just get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, if I could have somebody in my life who, who cares about me, and, and so we chase after that. And, no, we're, we're, we can't be single, so we got to get married. And then and we realize, oh, marriage isn't quite fulfilling this thing. It's not quite fitting. Well, if we have kids, if we have kids, then it's all going to be, oh, okay, we'll have kids, but there's still something missing. 
if I had more friends. But relationships only prove to leave us missing something. So then we pursue what? A career? Success? So the world is chasing after it. We're looking for something. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Success, that'll do it. So we dive into our careers. We dive into climbing ladders and, and, and achieving things, whether it's in sports or in business or in life. And we find that, man, career, success just isn't doing it. It leaves us climbing the top and getting to the apex, winning the World Series, winning the Super Bowl, getting the promotion, becoming the whatever, only to see that there's still a lot more space out there. It's just a greater view of emptiness. So we try other things. We try religion and spirituality. We think, oh, if I could just achieve inner peace, these guys say to do it this way, and, and this thing says to do it that way, this is what's going to happen for me. It, it, my yoga, I, I, I have a sense of peace for a moment. And then I go home and I realize it's gone just about as fast as I got it. What is it? We search for it. And yet religious spirituality just leaves us feeling conned. So then we try something else. We try entertainment. Will entertainment fulfill it? Will it, will it do it? But what happens with entertainment is, listen, the buzz always dies down. The, ru- the ride, the rush always comes to an end. You cannot be entertained forever. There's always the next day. And the next feeling. Then there's education. Some seek out education. I'll just dive into this knowing more. If I learn more, if I grow in my knowledge more and more and more, and we find that eh, at the end of it, there's only discovery that I don't know very much, and there's a whole lot more to learn. I only have more questions without answers. Education. uh, Identity. We start looking for Identity, and that's the big buzzword today, uh, identity. If our identity could just fit, if I could change who I am, if I was free to be just whatever I want to be, then my identity would change, and, and that's what it is. I just need to change who I am on the outside, but we discover that no matter who we change on the outside, the outside won't change who we are on the inside, and the emptiness remains. There is inside of every human being, in every soul, a God-shaped emptiness, empty space that only his love can fill. It's the only thing that will fit there. It's the only thing that will bring fulfillment. It's like the signature left on a painting, on a masterpiece, whether Michelangelo or, or Leonardo da Vinci, that signature that they put on their work that says, this is my work, this represents kind of like a signature that God was here. There's a part of me that was made to connect with God. You know, the gospel message, the Bible teaches us from beginning to end that the intention of God for our life was this relationship with him. And he created Adam and Eve, the the first man and woman on this earth to walk with him and to have this access to him, this connection to God and his love where they could talk freely and walk freely and they could rule over this this creation that he made for them to enjoy and to steward and to care for and to have purpose in. This was the original, but because of Adam and Eve's sin, there was something lost. There was a break that took place. The connection that we had, the fulfillment God's love connecting to the human soul was broken. It was lost. And so we've searched for this everywhere without the ability to find it. You might have heard the quote about the God-shaped hole or the God-shaped vacuum in our soul. And and you'll usually find it attributed to Blaise Pascal. And and really, it's not a quote of his, but it was his idea. He's the one that we kind of talked about this. He was a 17th century uh, French Uh, thinker, theologian, mathematician, inventor, scientist. And he made this statement, this idea, this understanding after he came to faith in Christ. He said this, what else does this craving 
and this helplessness proclaim, but that there was once in a man a true happiness, of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace, his signature. He was here. Something was left behind. Now this he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help. Since this infinite abyss or emptiness can be filled only with an infinite immutable object. In other words, by God himself. He says there is a God-shaped hole in the soul of every man and every woman ever since the fall that can only be filled by a reconnection, a relationship with God. Every other pursuit is emptiness. It's like, why are you searching for something living among the dead? Let me ask you that this morning, church. Where are you in this conversation? Now, you could have started a relationship with God. In fact, Jesus tells the parable that there was those who heard this word, they received it, they believed in Jesus, they believed the gospel, they received it with joy. But as they went on in life, they allowed the deceitfulness of riches, the cares and the concerns of this world to choke out this source. Because religion, if that's all you got, Religion will never replace relationship. And it's possible to have started and experienced and tasted the love of God only to go on in life and let that relationship atrophy like any other relationship we have with any other human being. That relationship with our spouse, relationships with our kids, all relationships require the investment but what God has given you is the opportunity through Jesus to have access to that flow of God's love. I can remember best moments of my life were moments where the love of God overwhelmed my soul in ways I can't, I can hardly express and I can't compare with anything I have ever found in this world. This is what drives me. This is what keeps me going, keeps me preaching the gospel, keeps me loving on people, keeps me moving forward. This is what keeps you when you get the, the cancer diagnosis to say, God still got me. I know it. Why? Because I've experienced his love. This is what holds me when sin is calling me, wanting me to go down a different road that says, no, 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 I will not sacrifice the love of God for that. I'm not, I, I, that's not worth it to me. The love of God. Where are you this morning in tasting and knowing and experiencing the love of God? That's the only thing that will satisfy. So as the story goes on, the angels are now talking to them and they're going to tell him something amazing that he's not there, that he's risen, just like he said. Here's what he says. He's not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still, in, while he was still with you in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest of the disciples. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. Empty beliefs. All of us wrestle with this reality because we live in a world that is so full of messages and, and ways and, and, and what people declare as truths and, and opinions and, and ideologies and, 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 and ways to God and man-made built 
they make sense, logical reasonings to how someone can, can set themselves free. It's everywhere. Man's thoughts, man's opinions, and we're all asking the same questions. What do we believe? Is there something to believe? Is there truth that cuts through the cacophony of voices out there and goes straight to the heart of it all that I can hold on to? Even in a day like today with the news constantly, you probably feel like most Americans that news always has seems to have an agenda. It's always trying to spin things to a perspective rather than just reporting the facts. And we get jaded. We get jaded. And we think of things like beliefs, something that I can put to action, a truth that I can get behind and stand on and move toward and move in. Boy, it makes it harder and harder to believe. Here they are wrestling with the same things. The first time Jesus told them he would have to die, he was going to be delivered into the hands of, 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 of the, the religious leaders. He was going to be uh, crucified. He was going to die. And then on the third day, he would rise. In fact, I know of at least three places where he says those words to the disciples, different places. And then he alludes to it in other places that this is indeed coming. And he'll tell them, I told you in advance so that when it happens, you might have faith and that your faith might last he said, I'm telling you these things are going to take place. They couldn't receive it then. They couldn't imagine that this would happen to someone that they loved, to someone who was giving them this kind of love, this source of love. They couldn't believe it. And so they discarded it. They didn't retain it. And now, here it is, Sunday. They witnessed the horror of Friday and the, re and the death and the crucifixion and the torture. They witnessed all of that. And now you're telling me on Sunday... That he's alive. That he's not really dead. Really? I can't believe it. It sounds like an idle tale. It sounds like something too good to be true. And here's the deal. None of us want to play the fool. None of us want to be conned. And there's so many cons out there. The Bible calls the devil the deceiver, the father of lies, that he speaks his native tongue his native tongue is only lies, always. And there's so much deceit in the world. But here this message comes across again. 2,000 years, there's an empty tomb. It's missing the person who was in it. And the person who was in it is the one who said, I'm going to rise again. I'm coming back. 4,000 years after Adam and Eve fell and we were disconnected from that, Jesus came into the world. He laid aside his divine glory and he entered his creation. The Bible says he humbled himself and became like us. Now he was still who he was. He couldn't change the fact that he indeed was God. But he took on flesh. And being born a human, the God-man Jesus repaired the connection between God and man. He walked with these disciples for three and a half years. Think about what was going on in their lives. They were all living empty pursuits, living out, just doing whatever, knowing all along like all of us have known in our life that something was missing. And then Jesus appeared, God in the flesh. They experienced the love of God. And he taught them who God was and what God was all about and how he felt about them and who they were in his eyes. And then he spoke about these days that you and I now live in where God would come and dwell again his love, his spirit within us. In these human bodies, in this broken soul, he would come and take up residence again. A day when our spirit would be born again and we would be born of the spirit, able to reconnect with God, where everything would become new, a new day. And a day when he and the Father would come 
and make their dwelling again with us on this earth. This is what he pointed them to this day. What do you believe about Jesus? That's really the crux of the question. The tomb was empty. It was missing the body. But who was that? Who is Jesus? Everybody has to answer the same question. In fact, Jesus posed this question to his disciples. But who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you. Blessed are you. And blessed are any one of us that would come to know who Jesus is. And lastly, we deal with the news of this empty tomb. This empty tomb. I love verse 12. That's all as far as I'm going to go in the story. So the, the women come back. They tell them what they learned. They tell them what they heard. They're like, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this. I don't think I can believe it. But Peter wasn't content with just the news. He wanted to see for himself. And he ran to the tomb. It says, but Peter rose, ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter ran to see if the tomb was indeed empty. Because if it was true, that Jesus rose like he said he would, that he is the Son of God like he had declared out of his own mouth that he was, that he is the savior of the world. He is the way back to a relationship with God. He is this coming king. If it was indeed true, everything would change for Peter. The empty tomb changes everything. You can silence every voice every religion, every smooth-sounding philosophy that is out there, every good-sounding ideology, and come right to the empty tomb and find Jesus, the risen Lord, the one who came, who died, and rose again, the Son of God who gave his life so that you could have his life living again in you. He says, I created you in my image and likeness so we could have a relationship. I created you to know my love and my goodness forever. What was lost in sin, what you've been missing in your soul, I came to restore that you might have this life overflowing within This is the same news that was shared 2,000 years ago that is still being shared today. And it's meeting people. It met me. It met me. It meets me every morning. And it could meet you too. The love of God is the most powerful force in the entire universe. Not only does it reconnect us with the love of our Father, not only does it transform us from the inside out, it heals us, it renews us, it grows our faith, it causes us to live differently. Along with that reconnection was a promise that the Holy Spirit would come and he would be with us forever. Jesus said, I am going to go away. I have to go back to the Father until that time that I would return and reign over this creation. But I'm not leaving you alone. I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. And I believe this is a message to his church today. Don't just settle for a story. Don't just settle for something that happened that you believe to be true. Okay, it's true. If you believe that it's true, then take it all the way. Run to the tomb yourself. Receive that love every morning. But more than that, receive the promise. The promise was this, that I will give of you my spirit. The Holy Spirit would come. 
And he would live in you. And he'll transform you. And some of us who wrestle with and struggle with bad habits and, and things that are destroying our marriages and our homes, we see the destructive forces of sin alive and well around us. Have given in to this is as good as it gets. And Jesus says, oh no, my reconnection with you means a whole lot more than just knowing my love. It means knowing my power, letting me come and live in you. Are you letting him live in you? Have you been empowered by the Holy Spirit? Have you asked him again afresh, God, I recommit that this is the temple that belongs to you. This is yours to dwell in. I want a relationship with you. That's why Jesus said in John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you're going to bear much fruit. But apart from our relationship, you can't do anything. Does the love of God abide in you? Because if it's abiding in you, it'll be transforming you. And you will find you will be a different man, a different woman, a different son, a different daughter. You're going to grow into the person God created you to be because what he released in you is life. It's love that crowds out the fears, answers the insecurities, declares that you are his and that he is yours. Don't hide. Don't hide. Don't hide. Don't hide from the light of the love of God. Yes, we know that we've blown it. Yes, we recognize when we've sinned. Yes, we see if we open our eyes, we can see the destruction that we can do to other people because of our selfishness and our broken soul. Our souls are what are being healed. Our spirits are alive to connect, but our souls are being healed. They've been damaged by all kinds of things. And God knows the whys behind your actions. He understands the place of brokenness and what it was that you've been pursuing, the why behind you may have done something you are so embarrassed of or ashamed of and the gospel comes and says but I still love you and more than the fact that I still love you I understand why you did that broken thing would you let me in so you can experience afresh the forgiveness that I've come to offer you and the love that I've come to bring you. And then you and I commonly find ourselves saying, well, I'm not worthy of that. I'm not worthy of that kind of love. I have to earn my way back because I was the one who made those mistakes. I did these things that I'm embarrassed. I need to earn my way back in. And he says, that is not the way back to the Father. The way back to the Father is to Jesus and Jesus declared to his disciples, I am the way. I am the truth. No man, no woman can come to the Father except through me, what I have done for you. That's why Friday had to happen. That's what the cross was all about. Pastor Adam's going to lead us in a song. And it can be for all of us today, the response of our heart. Run to the Father. I need to fall back into grace. I'm done with hiding. I'm not going to hide anymore. My heart needs a surgeon. I need you to get in there. I need you to bring healing there. My soul needs a friend, a reconnection with God. So I'm going to run to the Father, not once, but again and again and again and again. And I believe today his arms open wide. He's waiting for you just to return and say, God, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to the arms of my Father again today afresh. And my prayer for you as you sing this out in your homes, as you sing it from your heart, is that you would allow his love to flow freely and fresh again in you. Let's sing this together and run to the Father. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I was 
wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now. I'm laying it down, and I know that I. Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again. Redemption, the price for my heart. I don't have a contact for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. Run to the Father. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus this morning. If you would answer that question I asked at the very beginning, is something missing in your life? Well, the answer to that for all of us was yes, until we found the Lord. And you can run to Jesus today and through Jesus find that reconnection in your soul. Come back. But how would you do that? How do I receive Jesus? And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Just some things to understand. Remember, God's word declares that what sin did is it separated us. That's what broke that. That's what our sin did. And all of us have sinned. We know that. We've all blown it. None of us are perfect. That's the problem. That's the separation. But sin Sin doesn't go away. 
Sin is still there. And so we all come and just simply do this. We confess it. We confess it. We've blown it. We confess with our mouth that we've sinned and that we need a Savior. And that may be the hardest thing because you can't earn a Savior. You can only need a Savior. And Jesus came to die for the sins of mankind. And so we confess it. Nothing we can do to earn it, but forgiveness is what Jesus freely offers us. God's word declares that sin also carries with it a curse, the curse of death. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we have to receive it. You can't earn a gift. It won't be a gift. But the gift of God, eternal life, is what he's offering you today. And that has to be received. It can't be earned. But Jesus came to make it available to you. Remember this. If you know nothing else about the Bible, please learn to read your Bible. But this verse you might have heard before, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever would believe in him, in Jesus, would not perish but have eternal life. That is the why behind God's what? It's his love. That you might not perish, but that you might experience eternal life. So how do we receive it? How do we make this confession? Romans 10 verse 9 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. And so I'm going to lead you in that prayer. And if you need to pray that prayer with me today, then just simply do this. Repeat after me. I'll ask everybody in the house to just simply close their, close their eyes and bow their heads so others can have a private moment. And just everybody repeat this prayer, even if you don't need to pray it because you already have a relationship with Jesus. Let's all pray it together. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I confess today that I need a Savior. My own sin has separated me from you. But I believe that you came to this earth to die on a cross in my place. And that by your sacrifice and your death, you made life and forgiveness available to me. Jesus, I receive you into my heart. I want to know what a relationship with you is all about. Would you come now and fill this place in my soul? I invite your promise, your Holy Spirit, to come now and live in me and make me new and help me to live this life that you've destined me for and to transform me into the incredible person that you created me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you pray that prayer, salvation has come to your home, to your heart. Believe it and walk in it. God bless you and happy Easter.
the child.